Okay, so I first tested out Samsung's Tab S8 Ultra a couple weeks ago, and my first reaction was like, this thing is huge. It's like comically big, and there was this notch at the front of the whole device that seemed unnecessary. But having had this for a bit, this thing is awesome. And I think that this is gonna be a very popular device, way more popular than I thought it would be when I first saw this thing. And apparently Samsung suspended the pre-orders on this thing because they were selling out of it so quickly. Now the screen on it is a 14.6 inch monster. It's a very big display, but it's also a very thin device. It's only five and a half millimeters thick. If you hold it in your hands, it feels abnormally thin. Like it doesn't feel like a regular tablet. But one thing to keep in mind is despite its size, like when you look at that, you're like, this is definitely bigger than the iPad, right? It's actually narrower than the 12.9 inch iPad. So when you hold it in portrait mode, it doesn't feel weird or anything. It's a little top heavy slightly, but I think for most people, they would find it relatively normal. It's only when you hold it in landscape mode that the width feels different than a regular tablet. Now, I still don't feel like this is an uncomfortable or like unwieldy experience. It's big, but it's okay because with big tablets, you're not holding it in your hand the whole time. You're kind of holding it to set something up, get into a program, and then you'll place it down to watch a show or play your game or do some work, whatever it is. It's rarely a fully handheld experience with the bigger tablets. Now this device has very thin bezels around the whole screen. It's a very nice design aesthetic and I think a lot of people enjoy the look of it, right? However, when you have a tablet with thin bezels like this, when you hold it in two hands and it's not cased or anything, the meat of the palm of your hands often triggers the screen and it gets super annoying. Now, this only occurs on this product if you don't have a case on it, but the moment there's any kind of bumper around the edge, the problem disappears. It's just that not every case has that kind of raised edge. So some of the keyboard cases or some of the slimmer profile cases, they don't have that kind of edge protection. So you're still gonna have that problem if you're using the device handheld. The display is really good. It's big, the colors are fantastic on it. It's 120 Hertz and One UI does a really good job maintaining a high refresh rate on it throughout the whole OS. I do wish it was brighter though. So I'm measuring the screen at just under 400 nits, which is perfectly fine for indoor use. You don't get that pop with HDR content, like that super bright spot that you'd sometimes see in some shows. And this is not great for outdoor use. Like if it's super sunny or if you're in like a really bright environment, it can feel a little dimmer, like in bright studio lighting. I'm like, I wish this would just go a little bit brighter, but that's not my issue with it. It's the fact that this is their premium tablet, right? This is a product that's supposed to be the best tab product they make. And it's like a reasonably bright screen, but it should be brighter, especially when you compare it to Apple stuff that can break over a thousand nits at the top end. But overall, it's a really good screen. Now with this large screen, you get a lot of real estate and it's great for multitasking with split screen and you can have a few more functional windows than you normally would on a smaller device. And with Samsung DeX, there's just more real estate, right? There's just more stuff to have all your resizable windows and repositionable windows. And DeX, it's like a Windows-like environment, right? So having more screen makes it exponentially more useful. If you connect up a keyboard and a mouse to this device, you can get a lot of stuff done. You can obviously connect it to an even bigger external screen if you want. But the real magic behind the Tab S8 Ultra is with media consumption, because when you have a big screen like this that is as wide as this screen, it's a really nice experience. So shows and movies look really nice on this OLED panel. And even though it doesn't have a 4K display, it is able to take the higher bit rate streams, like 4K streams, and make use of that higher bit rate to display it. So some devices can't do it, but this accepts the codec, which is great. Now the speakers are awesome. There's four of them, they're tuned by AKG, they get loud, and I'd say they're at least on par with what Apple's bringing on their 12.9 inch iPad, potentially better. All right, so the notch up here has two cameras. There's a wide and an ultra wide. And the image quality on these is so much better than what Samsung had previously. So this is being shot in the ultra wide. I think it looks pretty good. There is no image stabilization though. So if you're hand holding these shots, it might be a little bit shaky. And this is the wide. And I think this looks really good for a camera coming off of a tablet. But again, there is no image stabilization. There's also the auto framing feature, which tries to track you around as you move your face. It doesn't do a great job. Like I feel like, you know, I'm gonna put this down to give it a proper representation of it, but I feel like Apple's center stage, like the original version of this is so much better. This is, it's not as responsive as I feel like it should be. There's like a bit of lag and it kinda, I don't know, it kinda jerks around as you move it, but it's okay if you're looking for something like this. 
Now, when I first saw this notch, I was like, come on, dude, do you really need to put a notch on a tablet? Like it's just, it's coming from Samsung too, right? This is a company that chirped Apple for putting a notch on their phone. It just felt really weird. And if you look at the housing of this thing, it doesn't really seem like you need the extra space from that notch, but the image quality is good. I'll give them that. Now, these devices, including the Ultra, but all the lower ones as well, come with an S Pen. This doesn't cost extra and it attaches magnetically to the back of the device, like so, or the top of the device. And it's a really nice pen, but you can only charge it if it's attached to the back. If it's on the top, it doesn't charge. Now this S Pen has a soft rubber tip that feels quite different from the hard tip of an Apple Pencil. It's hard to say which one's better or worse. I think it's a very personal preference. Uh, I will say though that this mimics a pen to paper feel better than the Apple Pencil does. I feel like that's just like, it's hard surface with a hard tip and it's just much more scratchy. This has a little bit more friction, but it doesn't feel like natural paper either. It does have very low latency at 2.8 milliseconds. It's not completely lag free, but it's pretty close and it's got great pressure sensitivity and the palm rejection is solid. And there's a lot of good drawing apps on Google's Play Store nowadays. There's also a very neat feature on Samsung's tablets now called second screen. And it allows you to connect this tablet as a secondary screen for your PC. So like your desktop or your laptop, you can connect it effortlessly and it now has a secondary screen. So it's built into one UI. It's very easy to set up, but there is some latency in that connection and you don't get full S Pen functionality on that second screen, but it's not bad as an art tablet connected to your PC. Now in terms of performance, this is the base model. Eight gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage, and it's running that Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, their newest chip. And performance is great in terms of just the fluidity of the UI and regular tablet stuff is fantastic. However, if you benchmark this thing, you can tell that this is an underclocked chip. Now, I think the reason why Samsung had to do it is because of the thickness of this device. This is only five and a half millimeters thick. And when you think about how this chip is traditionally cooled and all the smartphones that we've been testing, those are big devices, well, bigger devices, you know, eight, nine millimeters thick. This is very thin. And when you're trying to cool this super powerful, super hot chip, and you have very little Z height, you just, you just can't, right? You can only put so much heat pipe, you can only use so much material in here to try to get that heat off of the chip. And I think that what they've done is they just run at a slower clock. So if you're buying this product and you're like, I'm gonna be the world's best Genshin player on it because I could, no, you can't because it doesn't get the best frame rates, which is unfortunate if that's what you're buying it for, for like high performance Android games, it's not the best at that. But I think for the rest of you, I think you're good. Uh, okay, now I wanna wrap up, oh, battery life. The battery life on this was surprisingly similar to the iPad. So I tested this with three different scenarios. One with 120 Hertz, I got seven, seven and a half hours of screen on time, battery life. Uh, another time I did it with 60 Hertz screen, the exact same test and I got nine and a half hours. So significantly better with the 60 Hertz screen. But then the third scenario, I just ran it in Netflix and I just did it in a loop with a screen at 250 nits and I got just over 10 hours of screen on time. So it's good battery life, but it's nothing super special or anything like that. Now in terms of charge time, this has a huge battery. It's over 11,000 milliamp hours. And in order to juice it up at a respectable rate, you need to pump like the full 45 watts that it can take. So at max charge rate, 45 watts, it takes just under two hours to go from zero to 100, like an hour and 10 minutes or something like that. But if you plug this thing up to a slow charger, like heaven forbid you have a five watt charger and that's all you have, it's gonna take you like three weeks to charge this thing up. It's a big battery. You need to have a fast charger to have this thing uh, in just an enjoyable experience. Okay, so there you have it, the Tab S8 Ultra. I think when you look at this product, the the first thing you're, that your mind is gonna go to is like, who needs a tablet of that size? Like it's insanely large. Like you look at it, like look at this thing. <laughs> when I look at the, when I'm like, I'm looking at the monitor here. I'm like, it looks so big in my hands, but uh, it's just functionally, it's awesome. Like it's straight up an awesome tablet. Now. The price, that's the other thing. So it's $1,100. You get the S Pen and a lot of the pre-orders have some kind of case or keyboard case that comes with it. It's just that if you're looking at this, make sure you're not buying it with the intent of using it in your hands all the time. Like it's not, not like a handheld tablet for you because if that's your goal, go for a smaller one. It's just, it's not built for that. I really don't think it is. Okay, there you have it, the Tab S8 Ultra. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thumbs if you liked it, subs if you loved it. See you guys next time.